Shalom Aleichem and welcome everyone as we have the pleasure and privilege to once again be able to study the parasha this week being Hazak Hazak Benit Hazak as we are concluding the Sefer Vayikra here in Chutz Laaretz with the conclusion parasha of Parashat Behukotai. The parasha starts off in Behukotai Telechu the person would go in Hashem's ways and keep the mitzvot. The passage continues, and you'll have rain at the time, and all the berachot will come. Harav Gamliel Rabbinowitz Shlita looks at this pasuk and says, What does it mean, im bechukotai telechu? You know, bechukotai comes from the word hok, decree. If you follow my decrees, but he says the word im, aleph mem, is the same letters as the word aim, which means mother, ima. He says the pasuk should be read for drasha point of view. Em behukotai telechu. If a mother goes in the derech of Torah, then and only then will you see the mitzvah observance in the children, and in the family. If the mother herself will walk in mitzvot, she will set the example for her children to follow. Contrary to popular secular belief, the mother of the family is the mainstay of the family. Meaning, she is the foundation of the house. The Torah gives, the Torah prescribes a wall, a role for Jewish women. They have two roles. Two roles that the Torah prescribes to them. A, the first famous one, as a kinegdo. She has to be a helper for her husband. Her husband has a chiyuv to learn, to daven, to do avodat hakodesh, and her job is to help him in that. That's her zechut. The Gemara says. What a woman has to go into the next world is that they provide for the husband and children to be able to learn Torah. But then the Torah tells us another job of the woman. She is Chava. Why? Because she's Em Kol Hai. She is the mother of all that's living. Meaning that the whole life, the whole Hiyut, the whole life that goes on in the family, it's all based on the mother. The mother's job is to put into a Jewish home the Jewishness. That means the children come home from school and they see their mother. She's saying a baracha on a fruit. She's saying a baracha when she eats. She talks a story. She says, reads a bedtime story, not Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You know, how to complain. That's what kids learn Goldilocks and the Three Bears. All they're learning is to say, this is too hot, this is too cold, this is too soft, this is too hard. And then they read it to them. Enjoy reading stories, other nonsense stories. She's supposed to be reading to them stories about the Chachamim, about the great sages, about how they had so much chesed, how they, and the lives that they led, they, they lived. They're supposed to see the mother at home. She's lighting the candlelights that she's davening to Hashem. They see that mother's davening, mother's doing this, mother's doing that. Think about it for a second to the Going back to your childhood, right? What are the most exciting times or feelings of, of happiness? It's something to do with your mother at home. Either was she baked something, said something, did something. You know, it was maybe a snowy day and you guys made a, a pizza at home. Whatever it was, the mother gives those feelings to children. And so the pasuk tells us, Em It all has to do with the mother. In 1944, the Panovich Rav, Rav Yosef Kahanemin, um, he founded the Yeshiva of Panovich. 1944, the Germans were coming close to Eretz Yisrael, General Rommel. His troops were practically at the gates of Eretz Yisrael. And the Panovich Rav was laying the foundation stone of Yeshiva Panovich. And while he was laying the foundation stone, he was crying his tears out. Tears were coming out. Crying his eyes out. And was mixing with the cement. 
That night they had a seudah for the yeshiva. And Rav Kahaneman said, you think that my tears and you think the yeshiva was built right now? He says, the tears that built this yeshiva was built 57 years ago. It was built by my mother. And he said over the story. The story was, they lived in Eastern Europe, very cold in the winter, and they only owned one coat. And he was one of four boys at home. I'm sorry, one of five boys. And he was the youngest. It was a snowstorm outside and the mother said, I can't take all of you to yeshiva tomorrow. You only have one coat. One by one. She said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make a lottery. Each one of you are going to take a piece of paper out of this bag. One of them says coat. The other four doesn't say anything. All of you are going to stay. Whoever, doesn't, whoever wins goes to yeshiva. Whoever doesn't stays home. All the boys, she said, we were all davening that we should be the winner. She gave us the choosing. She said, we can't open until the morning. She says, my mother got up that morning very, very early. She goes to my oldest brother and she says to him, you want to go to yeshiva? He says, yes. She says, did I win? Did I win? She says, no, you didn't win. I won. And she takes him, she wraps him up and then she takes him and walks him to yeshiva in the freezing cold. He's in the coat. She then takes the coat, walks back home and one by one wakes up the other sons and takes them all. And she, Rabbi Yosef Kahneman says, she took me last. She said, do you want to go? And she wrapped me up and she walked with me and people said, how can you do this? You're going to kill yourself. And she took her children one by one. And he says to the people that were gathered, he says, you think I built the yeshiva? You think my tears built the yeshiva? The yeshiva was built by my mother. When she showed me what it means for Torah, what how a person is supposed to go out to learn Torah, I was able to take that and put this into fruition. And today you have Yeshiva Ponovich. People talk about Ponovich Yeshiva, you know, the Tamid Chachamun that come out of there. It's a Yeshiva par excellence, you can't even compare it. And all because of a mother, of how she dealt with Torah in front of her children. How do we deal? How do we parents deal with Torah in front of our children? Do we say, hi, my last, whatever, it's okay. Now, now it's time for something else. You're supposed to show the Hashim the Torah. Not only show it, do it. We all, we all agree that Torah is important. Right? There's a famous, famous mashal. In Bechukotai Telechu, Rashi tells us, it means in Bechukotai Telechu, it has to be, a male is better. You have to work hard for Torah. There was once a boy, he was learning. And his, uh, he came to his father after a couple of years. He tells his father, listen, father, dad. It's not, I, 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 not, I, I, I learned enough. It's time for me to go out into the business world and make my way, make my money. My father said, don't leave yet from the yeshiva. You're doing so great. Stay in the yeshiva. You're going you're gonna to become something big. Stay. He says, okay, I'll stay for a couple more days, whatever, months, and then I'll figure it out. That night he comes back home and his father tells him, tell me something you learned in Yeshiva today. So he says over halacha, and he explains it clearly, he gives all the sources and everything. And the father says, wow, that halacha is worth a gold coin. He says, a gold coin? He says, yes, that is worth a gold coin. The son says, Dad, thank you. The next morning, the son goes on his way to Yeshiva. Famous story. He goes on the way to Yeshiva, he goes to the grocery store, and he says to the grocer, I want to get this, this, that, he puts it all on the table, and he says to him, I want all these things, so he says, okay, pay up, half a gold coin, he says, no problem, and he starts, starts to share with him the halakha, and he says it from start to finish, everything, and so now he tells the, he tells the grocer, now you give me back half a coin, half a gold coin, he says, what do you mean? He says, my lachar, I share with you, is worth a gold coin. So you have to give me back a, a half a gold coin, because it's only worth a half. And uh, he says, get out of here. You're not, getting, uh, you're not getting anything. And he goes back to his father, and he says, his father, I went to the store. I wanted to buy stuff with the halakha you told me. And the guy, uh, the guy said, no, nothing doing. His father said to him, here, come here. Take this diamond. Go around 
to the grocer and go to other people in the market over there and ask them how much they're willing to pay for this diamond. So he goes, he asks around 10, 15, 20, 50, 100. So he, son comes back home, he says to his father, what everyone say. He says, okay, now take this to the diamond dealer. So he goes to the diamond dealer. The diamond looks at him and says, this minimum $10,000. Comes back to his father. His father says the same thing. His father says, only people who are involved in the business of diamonds can appreciate diamonds. We, Baruch Hashem, can appreciate diamonds. We can appreciate the Torah. Obviously, I'm not speaking to non-religious people. I'm talking to people who are B'nai Torah, children of Torah. We, we love Torah. We love everything. What happened to showing our love for it? Showing it. You can talk to your child from today to tomorrow. But if you don't show it, you don't have anything. That's our first lesson. We're going to continue to our second lesson on this week's parasha. The pasuk tells us, we have here in the, in the, in, in the parasha, the tochicha, the curses, and we read them dafka before Shavuot, which is like a Rosh Hashanah. It's a, it's a, we have... A, we're getting judged and we want to get rid of the curses prior to the day of judgment. And we kind of fulfill them through saying them. The fact that we say it as if it happened. And uh, in the Tokacha, we have a very interesting Pasuk. Um, one of the Psukim that we have here, it says as follows. Shem says, I'll turn my attention against you. You'll be struck down before enemies. Those who hate you will subjugate you. You will flee with no one pursuing you. What does this mean? The Jewish people are going to be running away from their enemies, but there are really no enemies there to run away from. Meaning we're running away from our imagination. There's a famous story with the Rambam. The Rambam was the doctor of the Sultan in Mitzrayim in Egypt. And uh, his pos- he had a great position and many, many people were jealous of the Rambam. They told the Sultan, how can you, Hasra Shalom, put a Jew as the top doctor, you have to put a guy, to put a, an Arab. Right? You have to have uh, equity. <laughs> so you have to have uh, the Arab there. So they, uh, made a, they made a competition. The Tolton said the best doctor will win the position. What's the, what's the test? What's the test? The test was challenge. each challenge, each one is going to make a poison and the other one it's going to have to make the antidote for it. And whoever makes the antidote and survives the poison, he's going to become the number one doctor and he will remain, he will be the uh, physician for the sultan. So it was. An Arab doctor went to work creating a powerful poison. And the Rambam wasn't in the mood of killing anybody. So uh, he didn't really create any poison. Came the day of the challenge. The Arab comes and gives his poison to the Rambam. The Sultan, everyone's watching it. The Rambam examines it. Takes out his medicine chest. Takes a few things. Puts it together. Takes the poison. Takes his, med- his antidote. And he seems to be fine. Now, the Rambam gives his poison to the Arab doctor. The Arab doctor takes it. Starts to look at it. Doesn't know what it is. Smelling it. Looking at it. Doesn't know. He uh, prepares some sort of me- medication, not sure if it's going to work. He takes the um, the poison, takes the antidote, nothing happening. So the Arab goes, you know, they, they finish, everyone survives, so nothing, you know, stalemate, nothing going on. The Arab goes home, and he starts to think that maybe the Rambam created a poison that doesn't work until 48 hours later. So he's, now he's starting to get very nervous. So the first 48 hours, he's drinking water after water. He's trying to wash everything out. 
And uh, 48 hours pass, nothing happens. So he starts to think, maybe the Rambam made a poison that if you eat meat, then it activates the poison. So he stayed away from meat. Then he starts to think, no, if you eat eggs or you eat this, so he starts to eat, stay away from every type of food. Kills himself. Finally, about a week later, he sees the Rambam. And the Rambam sees he doesn't look so well. He's not eating, right? He's kind of... So the Rambam says to him, are you okay? And you don't look so good. And he says, I don't know. And the Rambam says, did you drink any milk? The Rambam meant that you should drink milk to feel better. And he says, I just drank milk. And he's thinking that the Rambam says that the milk activated the poison. And he went around crazy that he just drank milk. And within a few hours, he died. So now the Sultan calls the Rambam. And he tells to the Rambam, you are the number one doctor, you killed him. It's amazing how you killed him after a whole week. The Rambam says, first of all, I didn't kill him. He ended up killing himself. He says, what do you mean? He says, I didn't even give him a poison. Whatever I was eating that day, I crushed it up and put it in a little thing and I gave it to him to eat. It was regular food. So what happened? He said it was his own imagination. He decided on his own that after 48 hours, he's going to get poisoned. Then he felt it because of this, because of that, because of this, because of that. And he ended up killing himself. Masuk says that we'll be fleeing and no one pursuing us. This is one of the worst curses that could ever happen. Is that we're running away from something that doesn't even exist. That in our own imagination, we created problems for ourselves. And now we're running away from those problems. It's called the one it could be. Depending on how you, how you take it. Right? I, uh, I don't know if you ever played this game. Just to explain what I'm, what I'm talking about. Lahavdil, there's a game called Mastermind. I don't know if you ever played Mastermind. It's uh, here with the colors, and they have to choose the colors. If you see people or young kids who are starting to learn to play this game, they're not using their logic yet. And so what they're doing is they're assuming you have a certain color. Instead of making you know a scientific way of trying to really knock out which color it is and working up, one color at a time until you knock out which one is and which one's not. They assume that you must have put an orange. And, and they're going to go with that assumption until they go the whole game and they went it wrong. Why? Because the first thing that they did was assume something that was wrong. A person can live his whole life with a false assumption, running away from something that doesn't exist. So what are we supposed to be doing? What are we supposed to be doing as Jews? Our job is to always, always reevaluate, always look something over. If Sef HaTzadik threw his brothers in prison, then he comes three days later and says, I fear Hashem, I reconsidered sending everybody except one. That's what a person who fears Hashem does. He looks over the situation. Does it warrant Does it warrant to really be worried about something? Does it really warrant to be worried about something? That's what a person has to ask himself. A person has to start giving extra attention just like, you know, when a person starts to have a crunch on money, he doesn't have enough money, such as he's not making enough money. So what does he do? He starts to go through his finances, right? And he starts to put what, yes, what, no, what, yes, what, no. Person has to always in life reevaluate. Because you know what the truth is? We know, they say that time is money. We say money is time. But at the end of the day, our time is coming less and less every day as we live. Well, first, we don't even know when we, how long we're going to live for. And so it only makes sense that every day we reevaluate what are we doing. Did what we believe yesterday be really true for today? <clears throat> A person has to understand that. Imagination is great. It's great to have an imagination. But we're not to get fooled by the false publicity and outside yearnings. Our job is to stay on the true path, the path of Torah. We're going to give one more lesson on this week's parasha. It says in this week's parasha, and part of the Torah as well, it says, Ve'az yirtsu et avunam, the end of Pasuk Mem Aleph, that Hashem will take our sufferings, this is based on Rabbeinu B'chayim, he's comparing where it says, that the korbanot will make kapara for our averot. That this pasuk, also means 
that our suffering will cause kapara. There's a famous story with the Noda Yehuda that a person came to the Noda Yehuda and told the Noda Yehuda, he says, I have so much pain, so much suffering. Rabbi, can you please fix me? Please help me. I can't take it anymore. It's too much. So the Noda Yehuda said, listen, stay here. Let's talk about it. I'm take a break right now. Noda Yehuda left this man and uh, this man fell into a sleep. He had a dream. And in the middle of the dream, he started to scream. And he was saying, please, just a little more, just a little more. You know, you hear the season screaming in the dream. He walks over to him, what happened? What happened? He says, you don't understand. I just fell asleep. And they showed me what was going on in Shemaim with my neshama. They took me and they put me on the bed in Shemala. And they brought out the scale. They put my mitzvah, they put my averot. And my averot were outweighing. And then they started to bring in my <coughs> mitzvot. They, my mitzvot were very little. And then they started to add my pain and suffering. And my pain and suffering went on the mitzvah side. And he said the scale started to tip, 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 tip. But still it was right under the averot. And so I was crying in my sleep, please, a little more. Give me a little more pain, a little more pain. So I can get into Gan Eden. And I also want to know to be who this said to this man. The Nodavi Huda says to him, this is what you got from your dream? You got it all wrong? Why would you want pain? You saw in your dream that your Averot outweigh your mitzvot. Your job is not to ask for more pain. Your job is to do more mitzvot. Why are you screaming giving me more pain? It says in Yimara that we don't want pain. But if we had pain already, we take it. And we use it for ourselves. But you don't go ahead and you start asking for pain. There's a famous story with Napoleon, right? Napoleon was taking over all of Europe. But that didn't satisfy him. He wanted Russia as well. Right? Maybe Halavai should have taken it. But whatever. <laughs> and uh, he, got, uh, he got up to Russia and he couldn't conquer Russia. So he placed a siege around some of the cities. And he decided with a soldier of his that he wanted to go into Russia to see how the people were thinking about the French, about the army, where the people were weak and giving up, where the people were standing. He wanted to know how to go about his, uh, his war plans. The soldier said to Napoleon, I don't think it's a good idea. They might recognize you, they might see you. Napoleon said, listen, don't worry. You speak French. One of our Russian soldiers that we captured put on his uniform. I'll put on his servant's uniform. Napoleon said, I'll be your servant. And you'll be the general and I'll follow you. They walked into Russia. They went into the closest inn. They got into the inn. And uh, Napoleon and this French soldier of his are listening to what people are saying about. And people are like, we're not going to let the French in and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, one of these Russian soldiers nearby where they were sitting sees Napoleon. He turns to his comrades and says to them, that is Napoleon. I'm telling you, I once saw him so close face to face. That's him. Now, Napoleon realizes, and this, his general, his friend, the soldier also realizes they're in trouble. So uh, right away, the soldier that he was with, who was dressed in the general's uh, uniform, takes out his cup, turns to Napoleon, and screams to him, go get me more beer. So Napoleon quickly hurries like his, like his servant. And he goes to get the beer. He comes back. And as he comes back, he trips. And the beer falls down. And the general, who is actually his soldier that works for Napoleon, gets up, smacks Napoleon twice in the face, screams at him, and tells him we're leaving. Puts a gold coin on the table and walks out. At that point, all the soldiers that were saying it's probably Napoleon says, nah, that can't be Napoleon. That can't be Napoleon. It's impossible. If the guy hit him in the face twice. Once they came out, the uh, the soldier asks for forgiveness to Napoleon. He says, oh, please, please forgive me. I smacked you in the face twice. And uh, Napoleon says to him, forgive me for what? I should reward you. The fact that you smacked me in the face twice, let those elder soldiers think and believe that I wasn't Napoleon. Sometimes we get smacked in the face, not once, not twice, maybe a few times. But we have to understand 
where they're coming from. They're coming from the place of the most love. We've said this already. You think your father loves you. You think your mother loves you. The truth is, they love you to an extent. But the one who really loves you at all times is that Kaddish Baruch Hu. And if he's giving you a slap, the two slaps, we take it back. How about we say, please don't slap us anymore. But we take the slaps with love and they get to be used on the side to help us get into Gan Eden. They go on our mitzvah side. There's um, one final story that the uh, Rav Galinsky brings down that there was a uh, in Eretz Yisrael Rav Galinsky was in the hospital and one night the doctor walks into Rav Galinsky and tells him I have to speak to the rabbi. He says, what happened? He says, last night I had a dream. There was a patient in our hospital a young boy who got into an accident wasn't feeling well. He was on uh, life-saving machines and the hospital made a decision to shut off the machines and a night ago last night we shut it off and he died I went to sleep and in my sleep this boy came to me in my dream and he started to scream at me he started to tell me that because of me he couldn't get into Gan Eden because he needed four more days of suffering in order to get into Gan Eden and because you shut off my machines you didn't let me get into Gan Eden. He was screaming and yelling and being very upset at me. So he asked Rebbe Galinsky, he said, I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. Rebbe Galinsky told him, what you have to do is you have to start doing mitzvot. You have to become a religious Jew. He says, Rabbi, I can't become a religious Jew overnight. I'm a chiloni. I'm not religious at all. Rebbe Galinsky told him, the minute you decide you're going to start doing mitzvot and following the Torah, that's already would be counted. And that already be as a foot for this boy. You want him to stop plaguing your dreams? You have to turn and become a Baal Tshuva. And that's what happened. And he became Baal Tshuva and Baruch Hashem. He changed his life. And hopefully this young boy got into Gan Eden where he was supposed to go. I think the point of this is, is how we react to what we perceive as being wrong and unjust. Because the Kaddish Baruch Hu never gives anything that's wrong or anything that is unjust. Everything comes from the Kaddish Baruch Hu is with the Hava, with love. And our point is to take it on the stand that yes, we can ask Hashem not to give us pain, not to give us suffering, but Hashem to complain about it. That we can't do. That we have to take with full dose of love. And with this, I wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom.